Good evening, everybody. Um, hello, my name is David Bovin, and I am the president of the American Heraldry Society. Um, and I want to welcome you to the first in a new lecture series that we've uh, established uh, as a society. Excuse me. Um, that we've just established this year. It's, it's promising to be a, a great opportunity to learn a little bit more uh, about the international influences on American armory. Um, and now I am a, a teacher by training, and I've uh, spent the last year and a half or so uh, teaching remotely. So I'm used to interacting with people online, but usually I'm in a Zoom room uh, where I can see little boxes of, of different people. So this is a little bit different for me, uh, but hopefully, hopefully everything uh, goes all right today. Um, just a little bit about the American Heraldry Society before we get started. Uh, it was founded in 2003 uh, and has been working since then to educate Americans about the art and the science of heraldry and also to share American armory uh, with the wider world. If you would like to support that mission uh, and lectures like this and the work that we're doing, uh, I encourage you to visit the Society's Facebook page uh, or its website to find out more. Um, so just as the United States is a diverse place with peoples, with ancestries from all over the world, the armorial practice in this country is diverse. Um, and though the origins of heraldry lie in medieval England, uh, or medieval Europe rather, uh, there are major differences in the way heraldry is done from England to Italy, from Poland to France, from Norway to Scotland. And in addition to these national traditions in Europe, uh, American Armory has absorbed influences from Asian and African and Native American sources. And the hope is that this lecture series will help us to understand um, a little bit more about where American heraldry comes from. Um, before I started talking, there was a video that was showing some of the upcoming lectures. Um, be sure to stay tuned to our Facebook page for updates on these over the next year or so. Uh, tonight's lecture is an exciting one. Uh, we're going to be hearing from uh, Ethan McDonald. Uh, Ethan McDonald of Aberone is uh, the herald to Clan Donald USA. Um, he's a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. Um, although he's undertaken serious study of heraldry uh, as an adult, the subject has fascinated him. Like, like many people with an interest in heraldry and armory, the subject has fascinated him for, uh, fascinated him for much of his life. Um, he's a full-time student today, uh, but he also spends time making heraldic banners, and he also curates a YouTube channel, uh, which you can find on YouTube called Aberone's Armorial, which he has lots of great introductory videos uh, about heraldry. Um, so his topic tonight is, is Scottish heraldry, right? A, a, the um, proud Scottish community has been a part of American society for many years. People go to Highland Games, they wear tartan designs, um, and Scots in America have made a, played, a, played a big part in shaping our culture. Um, and this can be especially seen in their heraldic influences. Uh, this is one, we just, one reason we've decided to kick off this series um, with a look at Scottish heraldry. Um, just a little note about the way things are going to work today. Um, if you have questions as Ethan is talking, um, if you have questions um, about something he said or you want uh, more insight into some of the things that he's talking about, uh, you are welcome to uh, post those questions to Facebook Live or YouTube. This is, this is streaming in both places. So wherever um, you are watching this, you are welcome to post questions for Ethan there. Um, at the end of the lecture, after he has given the lecture, um, we will, uh, I will go through and, and pull some of those questions that people have um, and, and pose those to him for him to, um, to share a little bit more. Um, Ethan has also um, invited people to a, a post-lecture uh, Zoom uh, chat. So much like if we were at a uh, university uh, hearing a colloquium or a lecture, uh, we might um, decamp to the pub for, for further discussion afterwards, um, this will be something similar. So this will be uh, a, a more uh, social, uh, more informal um, thing. If you want information on the link for that, you can go to um, the, um, the American Herald Society's uh, Facebook discussion group. He has posted uh, information there. Um, so I'm going to pull Ethan into our... Um, room real quick. So you can see uh, Ethan there. Um, he is going to be um, sharing some slides and things like that. 
Um, but without further ado, um, I'm going to um, turn things over to him for his lecture, uh, The Unicorn and the Eagle, Scottish Influences in American Heraldry. All right, so I'm gonna move myself out. Well, thank you, David, for that wonderful welcome. And thank you to the American Heraldry Society for having me today. Um, as said, my name is Ethan McDonald. I am the Herald to Clan Island, USA, and I have been an avid heraldic enthusiast for a long time. So getting to present this lecture today has been an amazing opportunity. So I thank you. I am going to share over my screen and we will get started. Bear with me, new platform for me. There. All right. So I would like to start our presentation by welcoming everybody and to everybody in the community. I thank you for having me. So Scott's heraldry is a very unique form of heraldry. Arguably, it's the longest and most well-curated form of heraldry in the world, stretching back hundreds of years. Um, it is an in, it's characterized by many unique items and symbols and charges and ordinaries, things that are just not found anywhere else in the world. Um, and I think for a lot of people, the biggest hurdle for understanding it is its intricate system of cadet differencing which is all of this wonderful subject is curated by the Court of Lord Lyon, which is the heraldic body in charge of all Scots heraldry in Scotland. Um, if you would like to see that, there is a wonderful banner off the top of one of their recent grants that shows all the arms of the officers of arms, including Lord Lyon in the center there. So the two big uh, functionaries that work between Scottish heraldry and Scottish culture are the Court of Lord Lyon and the Standing Council of Scottish Chiefs. The Court of the Lord Lyon regulates arms. It does not regulate the clans. It does not regulate their function. That is for the Standing Council to decide. So the arms of chiefs and the arms of the members of a clan who have arms granted in Scotland are all regulated under the power and the authority of the office of Lord Lyon, King of Arms. Then the Standing Council of Scottish Chiefs, which is made up of all of the chiefs who are currently recognized by the Court of Lord Lyon as being full clan chiefs. They make determinations and decisions based on what they believe clans should be doing and what they do in Scotland and abroad. I think there's a common misconception that Lord Lyon regulates all arms of anyone who is a member of a clan, and that jurisdiction is very clear that Lord Lyon's authority begins and ends in Scotland. So while Scottish heraldry and its customs may have outgrown it, some of that authority is only vested in Scotland, whereas some of the other traditions have made their way into other systems. You can see this very painfully in Canadian heraldry and, of course, American heraldry. Now, before I get into some of the more intricate matters of Scottish armory, I think it would help to understand how it fits into the Scottish clan system because they do feed off of each other heavily. The clan system has been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. It goes back a long time. It has evolved over the centuries, but more or less it is broken down into these four ranks nowadays. You have your chief. Clan chiefs are the head of their entire family, their entire body. They are either inherited into that position or they are appointed after an election, a family convention basically where the armiduous members of a clan vote on a new chief. This usually happens after a clan chief's line has died out or the clan has been chiefless for many years. This has happened more and more recently with a lot of the older clans who lost their chiefs in the 1700s and 1800s. So you have your chief who is the head of your clan. You have the chieftains which are an interesting group, and I will touch on that later um, in a moment. But you have your chieftains who have traditionally believed to have been the heads of larger families or subdivisions inside of a clan. Then you have your gentlemen, your armagers, who are the armiduous members, the gentlemen of a clan. You know They are not ranking as in 
commanding the armies or things like that, the forces of the clan. However, they are usually quite active. They have other duties to fill and they are appointed to those positions. Then you have the clans folk. That is everyday people who say, I'm clan so-and-so. You are, that's the clansmen. Now, the heraldic device used to categorize this for the armiduous people, that is, is done by showing feathers behind the crest. So the crest off the arms is always shown in Scotland for an armiger. Is shown by using a plain circle or the crest by itself, either on a torse or on a, coron a crest coronet. So our armagers, the gentlemen, usually wear one feathers, one feather. The chieftains have always understood to be wearing two, and the full chiefs, the chiefs of clans, wear three. Um, some extra adamants that have been added to this heraldic device have been um, circlets or scrolls showing the mottos wrapped around the crest the plain circlet, or just leaving the crest alone. Um, personally, I think a lot of the putting a circlet around it is a stability thing when this is being made into badges, but that's a whole nother tangent. So we have that. Then we have the addition of if somebody is a feudal baron per se, or a duke, or whatever rank they might hold in the British honor system and the nobility or in the peerage, their coronet of rank may be added above the crest so shown here on the right, there is, I believe that's an Earl's coronet showing five orbs on this badge. Now, there is also an extra thing here that is not shown, and that is the badge of a sovereign. So a Scottish sovereign is allowed to wear four feathers behind their badge, um, with princes being able to wear three as they are, you know, they're above a chief, but they're not the sovereign. So it's just understood that princes usually wear three feathers. Um, and there's actually quite a number of pictures of Scottish armagers wearing these badges, or sometimes they're actual feathers. I, for one, have a badge that has metal feathers. I also have a badge. I also wear a plain badge with two full feathers as well. Um, now, this middle ground area of chieftains can be not disputed, but sometimes contested. Because historically speaking, chieftains were the heads of major branches of the family. They were landowners. They were all these things. So that's kind of why feudal barons can get away being two-feathered people. People with, Some people with larger territorial designations and larger gravitas in their positions inside the clan can do that as well. So it's, it's a system that has more play to it than it seems. But it has trickled over. And if you go to a Highland Games in the United States, you will likely see somebody occasionally with one feather... Or if you see a chief or a chieftain there, you'll see appropriate rank. The clans folk, I will get into that, wear a badge that is their chief's crest or whoever they follow. So if they follow a single armager or they follow a chieftain or they follow a chief, it'll be their lairds, term that doesn't get used much anymore, their liege lord, whatever you want to call it, their over person, whoever they follow, it's their crest in a strap and buckle. Like this. So... The clans have outgrown the homeland's borders. They are not only in Scotland. They've been spread all over the world by immigration and clearance and many other wonderful ways where people have gone abroad or, you know, there's been sadder things where people have gone abroad there, you know, being removed during the clearances and such. But over the years, Scots and therefore their clan culture has been brought across the sea to other areas, America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, everywhere. So who's in charge when a clan outgrows its homelands? If Lion is not in charge of the clan outside the country, then who takes precedence? Well, I'd argue the chief, because that clan is not a nationalistic thing. It's not broken into the law of that country. It is a ethnic and cultural thing that has transcended borders. So the chiefs have full reign over their clans. Now, that also has some different things because you have clan societies. Here in the U.S., if you're joining a clan in the U.S., you are often joining a society of a clan or a recognized branch of a clan. And those overlaps can be in very many different ways, and it really depends on which organization you're a part of or which clan you identify with. Um, the clan societies have their own rules, their own processes, and how they regulate things internally. But that gives a really interesting thing, because that allows the clan to recognize arms 
from all different aspects of the world, different authorities, different customs of heraldry. So how does this affect heraldry and who regulates the clan heraldry? Well, normally that can either come down to the position of a high commissioner or a clan society president, or some societies may just have a person or a herald in charge of that. That's what I do. So here's where we're going to talk about private officers of arms, Scotland versus America. Now in Scotland, there are some percivants that are not attached to the court of Lord Lyon. They have been approved by Lord Lyon for certain chiefs, certain higher ranking nobility to have their own private officer of arms. Now, I think sometimes that gets confused. I think some people are in a camp that they think that that means that that person is in charge of all the heraldry of the entire clan. And then some people think that, well, that's really just the person's individual private officer arms attached to their baron's court or their entourage, whatever you want to call it, their household. I personally am in the latter camp. Um, if a chief wants to appoint somebody or appoint their personal pursuant or herald to be in charge of the entire clan, that's well within their right because a chief has the final say of what happens in their clan. But that can expand more or it can be invited down. For example, our chief does not, my chief has not appointed somebody to be in charge of the heraldry of the entire clan. However, he recognizes the authority of individual organizations, individual branches of our clan to appoint things. That's how I got my job. I am the herald to Clan Donald USA. So I regulate all American heraldry, all Scottish heraldry that is under the auspices of Clan Donald USA. So like I said, they're attached to the society and their powers can be broad or short defined by many different things. And it really just falls down to the individual. So with that, with that basics of where that grounding comes from, where some of these traditions come from, I'm going to talk about some American arms with Scots influence. These are all pretty early. They date back to mainly the 18th century, but they have, you know, some of them outlived that. Some of them are modern, that sort of thing. So we're going to talk about there. And I've only picked a couple of examples here. I think the first one I want to talk about, though, is this. This is one of the. This was the first proposed design for the arms of the United States. This was submitted in August of 1776 to the Continental Congress. The workers on this were Ben Franklin, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson. Now, none of them are heralds, and I think many of us here heralds look at this and go, "Dear God, why? Where's the kitchen sink?" <laughs> You know, but you see these interesting elements that will eventually make uh, make their way into the United States' arms. But here we have a couple of things that are interesting. I think the biggest being, though, the thistle, which was meant to represent Scotland. And the breakdown of this arms was the idea of quartering six different countries that have fueled you know, the six main groups that founded America. So they had a rose for England, a thistle for Scotland, the harp for Ireland, the fleur de for France, the red lion rampant for Holland and the double headed eagle for, of course, the Holy Roman Empire for the multitude of Germans. And then, of course, individual shields with the acronym, abbreviation, whatever you want to call it, for each one of the 13 colonies, you know, all those things. But here we have something interesting here. You know, while not regulated to only Scots heraldry, quartering has been used for many years this is more of an english or a continental style quartering where you're just adding everything together but i think it's interesting that from the beginning people the founding fathers recognized a scottish influence that scotland had had such an impact on early america that they chose to include one of its national symbols the thistle it's our it's our national plant batch so that has made its way there now as an episcopalian i have to do my shameless plug here but the arms of the Episcopal Church combine both Scottish and English elements to them. And it's very simple. It's St. George's Cross with a canton bearing seven smaller cross crosslets, which also represent stars, but they're in a saltire. And a lot of people think, well, that's a good way of arranging things. Well, not only that, but you can see that the saltire and the cross crosslet, both, very common prevalent Scottish symbols. I would almost describe the cross crosslet to being a uniquely Scottish thing. You see it in more arms there than you do anywhere else in the world. And of people's arms that I've seen cross crosslets in that are not Scots, they usually have some inclination or some attachment to Scotland for that to be included in there. 
And this comes from the Scottish influence in the, in the American Episcopal Church, or what used to be known as the Protestant Episcopal Church. And this influence came in as a result of the first bishop being trained and ordained, in, or consecrated, sorry, in Scotland, Samuel Seabury. Now, this one's a little more, you know, I wonder if by looking at these arms, you can tell that he had something to do with Scotland. There's quite a drastic, you know, open thing. You have his arms over a saltire, which is kind of interesting, even though this whole achievement was granted by Lyon as Samuel Seabury's arms back in the 1700s. It's kind of funny that it almost looks like a form of impalement or not impalement, sorry, marshalling showing an Asuchian of pretense. Um, a funny adamant here antidote was I had trouble finding an image of his arm of Samuel Seabury's arms. However, I remember that in the Episcopal Cathedral that I grew up in, there was a lovely window depicting the arms. So there they are, the arms on the left of Samuel Seabury, and on the right is a artistic representation of the diocesan seal for the, dio the Diocese of Western Michigan. And here on the right is something I got from the Diocese of Connecticut's website showing Samuel Seabury's arms. And the last one I want to talk about here before we get into our Q&A session is the arms of Alexander Hamilton. Now, as I mentioned, there's a complicated system of cadet differencing in Scotland. That is, of course, with the Stoddart system with direct cadets being different, you know, fathers from son multiple sons and cousins and that sort of thing. However, there's also the idea of stem arms. If somebody has the same surname as a chief, they might take the arms of their chief as an inspiration to base their arms off of that. And you can see that very plainly here with the arms of Alexander Hamilton, which has three sink foils over a red field as the arms of the Dukes of Hamilton, or historically the arms of the Dukes of Hamilton, and Alexander Hamilton decided to put a silver lion in the middle of his. So while these are not uniquely Scottish arms, they're also American arms. They are assumed arms used in the United States, and they have that Scottish influence. I mean, this is not a major difference between Ham Alexander Hamilton's arms and his chief's arms. However, in America, that differencing could be kind of overlooked because, you know, it's not as well regulated here. But you can see that direct influence, and that talks about how Americans who wish to have their arms reflect that tradition might include something like this. It might be a little more subtle, or it might be more blatant like this. Either way is fine, in my opinion. So with all that in mind, what is the Scottish influence on the future of American heraldry? Will we see a future American heraldic authority taking cues from Lord Lyon or from a system of cadency like is used there or maybe something else, maybe make our own thing like Canada? Will Scottish influence make its way into other aspects of American heraldry? Will it continue to be used by the clans or will it fade into existence? We don't know. I would like to see it cons can conserved and keeping in use. It makes it very nice to be both an American and show your ancestry by your arms. You know, one can look at arms that are uniquely American or uniquely Canadian or uniquely Australian or wherever. And if it has Scottish influence, it's very apparent. And that is to me important because it keeps that sort of thing going. So with that, I think it's time we can move into Q&A if David's okay with that. I don't know how he pops in or I can't see him right now, but all right, so here I am. Um, well, thank you very much. O ordinarily, if we were in a lecture hall with the uh, 20 or 25 people who have been uh, popping in and out of this, we'd hear applause. People would be uh, giving you some uh, some indication that they enjoyed your, uh, your lecture. Uh, but uh, since we can't do that, um, I'm hoping that those of you who are here watching will be able to share uh, your questions. If you type them into the chat, either on Facebook Live or on YouTube, I will be able to um, to see them and I'll be able to pull them in for uh, Ethan to ask. There's been a couple of questions that were asked uh, while we were uh, while you were speaking, so I will pull some of those in. But if you other people have questions, um, I will will certainly um, certainly do that. So I want to um, you know use my prerogative as the um, as the host of this lecture, and, and start off with the first question. I'm, I'm curious. I mean, you you've mentioned um, some of the 
uniquely or, or very Scottish symbols, things like the, the white saltier on a blue field and the thistle. And I mean, if you, you see those on a, um, on a shield, you often see a Scottish connection. I'm curious if you um, like have other thoughts on how Americans or other people of Scottish descent in other places um, can show Scottish um, Scottish heritage, Scottish connections, besides using those, you know, those maybe overused um, or often used symbols. Uh, do you have thoughts on that? Um, I do. I think I, I would, I'd hesitate to call anything overused. I think there are some things that could be considered overused. You know, oh, I'm Scottish. I'm going to put the salt iron in it. Or I'm going to put a rampant lion in it. How original. <laughs> but I mean, to each their own. You know, arms are meant to be a personal identification thing. If people want to have something like that in their arms, that's okay. Um, I think it can get complicated especially here in the U S where we have no authority. So it makes it harder to regulate those differences, to keep differences, to keep arms individual. And I think a lot of people misunderstand. I'm going to go off on a slight tangent here. I think a lot of people misunderstood, misunderstand the intent of an authority. It's not always there to say, no, you cannot have arms. You are just a filthy peasant. No, it's there to really make sure that the people that do have arms, the people that want arms, are getting their own uniqueness, that things are not getting repetitive. They're not getting stale. The whole point of arms is to be unique, to be easily recognizable. And I think that's really helped by that. So I've told people before, I've told people in various clans that if they want to show that influence, I try to steer them away from nationalistic symbols. That's the same with Americans, you know. If I had a nickel for every time somebody's come to me and said, I want American arms and I want red, white, and blue, and I want an eagle, a bald eagle on it, and I want stars on it. I was like, it's it's not unique. You're making a at that point, you're making an extra coat of arms for the United States. It's not a it's not unique to you. It's you know, like you might think those are important, but they're not the things that you want to represent you, I don't think. I've told people. And I said, you know, what what clan are you? I'm like, here's here's your achievement. Of, here's your chief's achievement of arms. Take one thing out of it, and then go from there. And it can be a color. It can be whatever. You know, having that link is important. And it doesn't always have to be an outward visible sign. It can be something that you know. And if somebody asks you, why did you do this to your arms? I'm like, well, I like this. You know, oh, my chief's arms have a, has a cross crosslet, but I like a cross flurry better. Or my chief has hounds heads, but I wanted dragon heads instead or something or a griffin's head, you know, or whatever, you know, it can be many different things. And I think that's unique. You know, it doesn't have to always be an outward sign. It can be an, something that, you know, that when people ask about it, it's like, Oh, here, here's a little cool little tidbit about that. If that sure. makes sense. Yeah. And that's great. There, if you want to expand on the uses of that, maybe you decide to adopt using a Scottish style heraldic flag or you decide to start using Scottish style ranking and you just keep yourself as a plain gentleman's helm or if you're of the rank, you know, maybe using an Esquire's helm, change it up. Maybe instead of doing mantling in your liveries, you do mantling in red and white, you know, things like that. So Great. Um, well, just hearing you mention um... Flags. There's a, a question that came from uh, YouTube from user HatchJP. Uh, it says, how might Scottish traditions uh, of heraldic flags be applied to armorial banners and other heraldic flags in the U.S.? I mean, are there unique things that could be carried over into, um, into American heraldry in that way? Absolutely. So for those people who don't know, besides Scottish arms being highly regulated, the regulations around who gets what flag and what flags are used for in Scotland is very specific. I've done a whole video. I did two videos and I'm probably going to have to make a third and a fourth just to cover things in depth because it's such a broad subject. So another, uh, another plug for your, your, your YouTube channel. Yeah, I kind of had, I kinda had to do that there, <laughs> but um, let's see here. So in Scotland, you know, other places like Ireland and Canada and England, anybody can get a standard. Anybody can get a guide on. Most people just generically go with the standard. In Scotland, they're set to sizes. They start at minimum three or four yards, and they go up to eight yards for the sovereign. And it's that's a big flag. Um, but things like guidons, pennons, uh, 
personal manners, that sort of thing. There are some things that are uniquely Scottish to it. So in Scotland, and I guess in the rest of the British Isles, there's the idea of adding a national cross to a heraldic flag. So the hoist of the flag may be your arms, or it could be the saltire, or it could be St. George's cross, or it could be St. Patrick's cross. Those have been done. Um, the French at one point used a blue field with a white standard cross. Um, I've seen an Italian one that was red and white as well. Um, and who knows, maybe America could pick up and do the 13 stars in a circlet on a blue field. That could be our national cross coat run goal. Or we could do a, a, you know, a saltire, you know, if I dare say it, you know, a blue field with a saltire of white stars or a St. George's cross or, you know, a standard cross of the white stars. They could be eight pointed stars, you know, the ones that George Washington preferred. <laughs> so there's, there's many different ways it could be done. And I really am more in the camp of using the 13 stars in a ring, but I think that would be a cool, you know, it's something uniquely American, but it borrows from that tradition of having this. So you might have your 13 stars, but you have your divided liveries and your motto on it, just like a Scottish pennon or a guidon or a standard wood. I think that would be really nice. Yeah. And I think there's precedent for it too. If you look at, uh, I believe it was the Duke of Wellington that had a standard granted by the College of Arms at one point that had, instead of having St. George's cross on it, it had the union flag on it. So it used, you know, the union jack, as we might call it here in the U S as the hoist part of his flag. And that makes sense. It's different. It's unique. Or you could use the arms of the U S I think that would work too. Though I would really like to see Lance pennons on, uh, anything associated with the U S Calvary today using the American arms with the divided, uh, red, white, blue livery and e pluribus unum on, them on the front of a Jeep like they Brits did in World War II. I think that would look cool. Will that happen? <laughs> Probably not. I'm not in charge. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, there's many different little things like that. You could take sure. the Scottish system and adapt it to match the American heraldry, if that makes sense. Yeah. That would yeah. be my inclination. Great. That. Uh, before we get to the next question, I just want to put this. This is from uh, Will Linden. It says, in the Society, of Crea Society for Creative Anachronism, which is the SCA, uh, we constantly get people insisting I have to include all of these symbols because they have a deep meaning to me. So I think that speaks to uh, this this sort of urge that you were talking about a second ago. So um, and I've, but, said, I've had friends come up to me and they're like, "Here's who I'm going to call somebody out here." And if they're watching, I do not apologize because it's a friend and I can get away saying this. But I have so many times that somebody sent me this. I made a family coat of arms for myself, and it's four to six quarters and each one just a plain color field with one little charge in it mm -hmm. with clobbered together supporters and crazy helms and banners and stuff. And I was like, Oh my Lord, like it doesn't have to be that representative. I'm yeah. of the unpopular opinion in the heraldic community that symbolism does not really matter when you're making it can like, you can have purpose for one symbolism, but the whole, this blue field is to represent valor or honor and the white is to represent purity and the cross is my faith and all these i'm like pick what you think looks pretty and come up with something afterwards that if you look at generations you can ask three generations of somebody who inherited arms and if they weren't told by their parent what it does they're gonna make it up on the spot and yeah. there are books where you can see that where they've interviewed the same british nobleman three times and somebody asks, oh what's what's this supposed to mean on your arms and you get three different answers over 150 years, you know? So sure. pick what looks, if you're, if you're trying to design your own arms or you're working with somebody, make, look at other arms, come up with something that looks cool, that follows the rules and is completely respectable for Berger arms. And then come up with some symbolism afterwards. You know, that's yep. a, it's kind of what the, everybody has done. So, yeah. Uh, we got a, a comment from uh, Facebook. This is from David Pope, who's the governor of the American Heritage Society. Uh, he says, could you speak to the Scottish method of differencing and any influence that this has had or has on American heraldry? Absolutely. So for those of you who don't know, the system of Scottish cadency is also called the Stoddard system. Um, it's similar to the English system where there is a set. This is the first son, second son, third son, fourth son, and so on. You know, it has exceptions and different marks for bastardry, you know, illegitimate children, which doesn't really get used anymore. And I wonder why. <laughs> and things like um, including women and stuff like that. And I think it, not to say that it's ever been co-opted uniquely for an American purpose, but I would say, 
I've seen plenty of Americans with American arms using the Stoddard system because they are of Scottish descent. And they're like, well, I want it to look Scottish. So I'm going to use the Scottish cadence mm -hmm. method. And I think that's important. And I think it's cool. Um, it's a very unique system. I think over time it starts getting a little complicated, but for, if you, if you're a pretty narrow family, not narrow family, but, uh, you don't have a lot of children. You're not, you know, it's not a hundred years ago where people are having 10 kids at a time and their 10 kids are having 10 kids. You know, when it goes into that, it gets kind of chaotic, but if it's a pretty simple family tree, I think it works very well to that regard. Um, basically how it works is there's the traditional three point label for the heir or the eldest kid. I think that's a confusing thing in Scottish heraldry. A lot of people think, Oh, this is automatically the son. It's like, no, because arms are heritable property. So that might not mean that's the person's son, but it's their heir to that arms, to that estate, if that makes sense. So for example, like I quarter arms right now, I use my father's and my maternal grandfather's quartered because I'm the only grandkid. I'm the only kid on both sides of the family. And my grandfather only had daughters and they don't want it. So it's going to pass right down to me. So I use the quarterings. However, if I wanted to, I could probably use my father's or my maternal grandfather's both with labels individually because I'm the heir to those. I think quarterings easier, but you know, but I've seen Americans quarter. I've seen Americans follow the same rules for quartering and the same rules for cadet differencing. I've seen people do what's similar for the main cadet branches of chiefs where, you know, you might have three kids and all of them are going to ha have their own families. So instead of doing different borders, they change the field color for all, you know, the, the eldest or whoever's in charge, whoever's going to inherit the main estate is keeping the father's arms. But the other two, they just change the background color or something like that, or they change one of the charges. So it's recognizable to be similar or related, but it's easier to identify that this is a new branch, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I hope that answers your question, David. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so a comment from uh, Michael McCartney on Facebook. Uh, he says, don't forget that many Scottish families weren't part of the clan structures. No clan, chief, etc. though they're still armors. Can you speak to that, like how that sort of uh, fits in, the, the yeah. influence of that on Americans? So a little bit of the background here. So the Scottish clan system was really only used in the Highlands. And it somewhat trickled into Northern Ireland through the Ulster plantations and reaving and whatnot. And it, it's made its way around, but you know, about 200 years ago now, well, 199 in a couple of months, uh, when there was the 1822 state visit of King George IV, um, there was a revival of this Scottish culture, um, mainly fueled by Sir Walter Scott, who he was the one who came up with this feather system. He was also the guy that got all the chiefs together and said, all right, we're having a festival with the king. Everybody show up in your traditional Gaelic garb and wear your clan tartans. And everybody looked around and said, what the heck is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so they had to sit down and come up with, you know, organize a big chunk of this. And so that's how a lot of these people in the lowlands and other areas of the highlands that were traditionally from an English or an Anglo-Norman descent or Irish descent, you know, areas that were not part of this traditional gal galedom started buying into this subject. That's how you get some places like Gordon. A lot of people call it clan Gordon. It's like, well, they've never called themselves a clan. They structure themselves exactly the same, but they are the house of Gordon. And there was this long push for a long time saying that, well, if you're from the lowlands, you're the house of, you're not the clan of. And that's well true, but you know, sometimes it's just like, all right, they're a clan. It's easier to call them a clan. So there have been places where they have no chief, but they've had armagers and sometimes that armager has led that small band but it had to do with population size you know your clan chieftains changed clans sometimes you know somebody could have been buddied up and been the chieftain of his little village and they decided i don't like my neighbor too much i want to get him to the other guy instead he's kind of less of a mean person so they just said all right i swear allegiance to you and he's like great you're now one of the chieftains of x clan boom yeah we will call on you should we need troops <laughs> so you have these areas that never had a chief and then you have new creations. Uh, Lord Lyon has been working with the Curries for a long time. They are not a clan. They are the learned kindred of Curry. I'm going to give a shout out to Robert if he's listening. Uh, you know, the Curries have weren't a clan on their own. They were originally bards to the Lords of the Isles, to the Donalds. But, you know, other chiefs would visit and go, yeah, I like your bard. I, I want one of those. And they would train people and they'd send them all over the West Highlands and Isles. And so as a result, this small family grew all over the place and they became, they, they've never had their own chief and now they're in the process of 
formalizing their structure because there have been groups in every other clan and they've come together. And I think it's really cool that the current lion has gotten together and said, you know what, you, you guys are a special thing. You are still a kindred, you're a family. You deserve to be, have a leader and have the same structure that these other families do. And same for the lowlands. There's people that haven't had a chief in 300 years or more. And they've gotten together and said, hey, we're growing larger. You know, People have spread around, we need structure. So I think that really shows that the system adapts. The system grows. And, you know, like I said, with the whole, what defines a chieftain? Nobody knows because it's up to the chiefs to decide, or it's up to whatever organization that's in charge of this family to decide who's who. So I think that's really beautiful that over the years, this system has become adaptable. It's not as rigid as it might seem from the outside because, you know, with my clan, it's my family. If I ever need anything, I can call on them and they'd be there for me. And that's great. And I think that's, a unique aspect of this and the heraldry reflects that because some people can be rigid about it. And the other times it's like, no, we're welcoming these people because they have shown that they show the initiative to be hard workers for their family. We need to give them this recognition as, you know, gentlemen or whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it. So if that, I hope that answers your question, Michael, there, if, you know, people that weren't in and have been included or historically never have and now are. So. Yeah. Great. Um, let's see a couple other questions. Uh, those of you who are still thinking about questions, make sure you post those to either Facebook live or to YouTube and we will make sure we, uh, pull those in. Here's a question about, uh, heraldic authorities, uh, in the U S if the U S were ever to create a heraldic authority, I know that's a big, <laughs> if, uh, that, that would ever yeah, happen, yeah. that the U S would ever care enough about, uh, heraldry at a, at a national or even a state level to do something like that. Um, how do you think, I mean, would it relate to something like the court of the Lord lion or is that too structured for a, a uh, Republic like ours that is uh, uh, 50 independent States or what, 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 what do you think? All right. So I've talked a lot about this and, you know, I'm an adamant person of, we need an authority not to say, no, you cannot have arms, but to say, okay, we got so many people of varying degree here let's make sure nobody's accidentally copying each other. And I think for now, this is a keyword now, we have a couple organizations that are doing a decent job. The, you know, 90% of people who are interested in heraldry in the U.S. are probably members of organizations, and we do a good job of pleasing ourselves, I think. However, as time goes on, I think that will be later an issue. Um, now, I love the Court of Lord Lion. I love that they have the authority and the structure that they do. However, most people don't realize that's been law. I mean, the position goes back to the 800s, to the High Shanaki, who was established under Kenneth McAlpin during the Kingdom of Alba. However, the, the, the current structure that we think of has pretty much more or less been unchanged since 16, what was it, 1632 or something, when the Lord Lion King of Arms Act was established. I might have the date wrong, but it's 16 something. That's four, four hundred and a half years of tradition and precedence and law. And most people don't realize this, you know, as a king of arms, a king of arms is directly appointed by a sovereign. That means they are that person. They were like an ambassadorship. They, they, they have these things. And, you know, Lion has even further legal powers in the court system. He is a court. It's called the court of Lord Lion for a reason. Would I ever see something like that adapted with powers in the U.S. court system? I doubt it. If it did, I think it would be more of a, we have a partnership, so we recognize the copyright law, the patents, basically, of that aspect of it to make sure the arms themselves aren't infringed. But I don't see something larger like that. I would, however, see something similar to the Chief Herald of Ireland's office. You know, the Chief Herald of Ireland is through the national libraries in, in the Republic of Ireland. I could very much see that functioning here where something is done through either the National Archives or the Library of Congress. I think that would make perfect sense. And should any governmental people be watching who has the power to make that decision, I will gladly fill the role of Chief Herald of the United States. Just a little, you know, somebody's willing to sit at a, you know, I'm going to say that they're going to shove me in some closet in the back of the National Archives and be like, here's your books, have fun. You don't get any funding. Because, <laughs> you know, America. But while I don't see the legal stick in the heavy side of 
that aspect being incorporated into a U.S. authority. I do see the tradition. I could see as, you know, Canada, when they have their, when Chief Herald of Canada and the Canadian Herald Authority was established, they said, you know, we'll use any system of cadency that people want. But they also took a lot of English influence and they looked at the English system and they said, hey, we are going to make something similar, but it's going to be uniquely us. I could see America doing that and making a unique American cadency system. Ca- cadency system. I could see us saying, you know what, we're going to adopt standard flag sizes. We're going to adopt things like a national cross for, you know, instead of being a cross, it might be that 13 stars like I talked about. So, or, you know, we might say these are the standard size for flags, or we might say this is that, you know. We might, you know, do what most heralds do and have tabards, but we might put in a uniquely American spin on it or something like that. So while I don't see the legalistic, you know, Congress sitting down with the president and saying, you know, right, this is our authority. They have supreme power. If you don't do it, you're going to get hit with a baton. I don't see that happening. However, I do see something like uh, archivist, archival thing being worked out. I think that would be more sure. going to see that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I think this is the last uh, the last question that I see on uh, either Facebook or YouTube. If you so, we'll we'll finish with this one unless somebody sneaks. Um, another one in. This one is looks like a it's a two part question from uh, Peter Middleton on Facebook. Uh, he says, "For someone who has both UK and US citizenship, a native born Scottish father and a US born mother of Scottish ancestry, um, who would be the correct authority to grant arms? And how do arms depict? So how do Scottish like if you're trying to follow the Scottish mm-hmm. traditions? How would you depict two different clan allegiances? Whether it's uh, Robertson and uh, Keith here or uh, or some other uh, uh, dyad of, of uh, sc- clan allegiances. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> okay, this is a twofold question, but I relate to this. So my father is a first-generation American. And his parents are from Scotland. I am so second on one half and third on the other. Kind of, a, I call myself one and a half um, because the family moved back and forth a few times and stuff between Scotland and the U.S. on both sides of the family. And have been other places, Canada, England, Ireland, everywhere. They've, but it's been more of the family picked up and moved, not so much there's ancestors from all over the place. But, you know, I can see this. I've had this question a lot, you know. Like I said, Lion has the authority to grant arms in Scotland for a UK citizen if you live in Scotland. So you could go to Lion, theoretically, if you have a Scottish uh, enough of a Scottish connection. A lot of people like to think that Lion... You know, and somebody from the court may correct me, but it is my understanding that Lion does not just grant Scottish arms to foreigners. They either have to have like a very good reason, like they have served a high position in a clan and are automatically approved. But the majority of Americans who go to Lord Lion decide to, that what happens is they have to find their nearest Scottish ancestor. Arms are then granted to that ancestor, and then you matriculate it down to you. So you could do that process for Lion and use that um, for one side of the family. So if you want to do that for your father's arms, you could do that. And then, you know, if your mother is round or, you know, there's maternal people, you could always work on arms for her and quarter them. Then you bear quarter arms. That shows the two separate stem arms off of those two different cadet branches. Or you could say, you know, so that's an option from one side and an option for another side. You could do two in Scotland and bring it down and talk to Lion about that. That would be up to him. You could also incorporate individual influences from both of those chiefly arms and combine them to make a new arms. I've I've seen people do that. It it can look good. And then you can just pick one or the other. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Or you could just sit here in America and either assume arms or work through an organization to devise. You know, we don't, no one really grants arms in the U.S., I think that does, that faculty has been filled by one certain organization, but I'm not going to do the open endorsement here. <laughs> but um, no, I think there's many different ways you can go about it. And I mean, you can reach out to me on Facebook if you wish. You know, I'm always willing to help out with that and advice. And as somebody who is maternally a Robertson, I understand the I want to show influence from both. So, you know, I think whatever way you go, you can't really go wrong if that makes sense. So. Hope that helps. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, let's see. So I think 
Um, that's all of the uh, questions that um, that I see on Facebook or YouTube. Um, if anybody has other questions um, and you just want to, uh, you know, grab a glass of wine or a bottle of beer and, and go to the uh, the post lecture Zoom room uh, with Ethan and, and chat a little bit. Like I said, the the details for that are in the American Heritage Society's uh, Facebook discussion group. So if you're a member of that, you should be able to go there and uh, and access those details there. Um, if there are no other questions, I will uh, just thank Ethan for um, for spending some time talking about this. There's lots of things that I've learned um, about uh, Scottish heraldry and, and about American heraldry, and I want to thank him for um, for doing that. And I don't know if Ethan can see the comments coming through, but there's been lots of positive feedback. Thank uh, you. Thanking I actually just posted one comment there. Of uh, I put the link. Oh, that was the YouTube link. Sorry, not the Zoom link. <laughs> Never mind. I can't. <laughs> I'm bad at that's, this. That's all right. <laughs> uh, but there, there's been lots of positive comments. We we don't have a room full of applause, but there's been lots of uh, positive comments. So I'm going to put uh, Ethan back in the uh, green room. Thank you very much, Ethan. Um, and uh, I will uh, direct people to um, to your Zoom room uh, after. Thank you. Um, and I just want to spend uh, a minute here uh, thanking all of you for coming here. I think. Uh, this has been a, a good experiment. We're hoping to do uh, seven or eight more of these over the next uh, year or so, maybe one every month or two. So keep um, keep tuned to the American Healthy Society's uh, Facebook page and other social media, and we will make it clear when those are happening. Um, I want to thank the um, the rest of the um, American Heritage Society's governors for doing that. We have a lot of other things um, going on or in the works uh, for the American Heritage Society. Uh, it's been um, it's been a period of rebirth for the society here as we've tried to jump back into some things that have been lacking.